Uh, you know, we've been uh, doing segments here over the past couple of months on some of the programs, going back 40 years and looking at my schedule for the particular month or the period of time or whatever. And we mentioned here recently that it was starting to get good because I, after I came back from my sojourn to the uh, Georgia territory that they created in the summer of 83, we all got sent back to Memphis, the Memphis Territory, when that folded up, and at the same time, business was big in the summer. Lawler had taken over the book. He was doing, you know, big cards, major matches, blah, blah, blah. But once that Lawler had brought in, we talked about he booked more guys on the cards than Dundee did when Bill Dundee was booker. And he had brought in all these guys and had 20-something or more in the territory, and then 10 or 12 of us came back from the Georgia thing when the co-promotion with Ole didn't work. So now there's 40 guys in the territory. And so they started running B shows, spot shows. When Louisville would run, there'd also be, you know, Osceola, Arkansas, or opposite Lexington, Kentucky would be Batesville, Mississippi, and, and et cetera. And I was on the the buttermilk run, as the Dream Machine used to say, on all these small towns with, you know, the other guys that Lawler hadn't figured into anything major or just had to serve their penance by going to be in the main event of a shitty show. So what happened before then, though? You, the idea that because of the amount of people there, there were all these buttermilk run shows, before that period of time, were any of these towns run? Were they only run, you know, were they run much less, like once every six they months? Well, they, they were, some of them weren't run at all. And some of them were only run once a year, but all of a sudden they were getting more often. They had Buddy Wayne out and Eddie Marlin out trying to find towns to keep these guys occupied. And for a couple months, it maybe worked okay. But as you'll see, and as we've talked about, some of them, you know, even if there were only 10 guys on the card or whatever, it was costing the office money. And the summertime, was a better time for the Tennessee Territory to draw than the winter time was in a lot of cases, especially in, you know, the, the small towns where you do a lot of big spot shows in the summer out at the ball field or whatever. So to avoid spending money unnecessarily, which was never a thing Jerry Jarrett was a fan of, as we went into November, which we're about to talk about, they were cutting out a lot of these B-shows. And so, therefore, I was off a lot more than I had been because I mentioned I was working almost every night and managing four, five, six times a night. Just go out with all the heels. Just do whatever, right? But now there's not as many shows to go and do that on. And they're trying to be more fiscally responsible. And that is when the talks started with Jared Jarrett and Bill Watts because Watts' territory, Mid-South Wrestling, was down. and he was. As we mentioned many times, searching, what am I going to do here? I need to change things. And Jerry Jarrett had a fire sale on wrestlers going. Let's get some of these motherfuckers out of here. We got too many mouths to feed. And these, these things were all happening at Saint. Let me, before we talk about this, let me illustrate something. I want to go to Memphis, Tennessee at the Mid-South Coliseum in November 1982. When Bill Dundee was the booker, I had just started in the business. I'm so going to give you the card. Go ahead. One year earlier. One year earlier. The card for November 15, 1982. First match to main event. Buddy Landell versus Carl Fergie. A coal miner's glove match with the Sheep Herders against Jacques Rougeau and Terry Taylor. Mid-America title match. Dutch Mantell against Jesse Barr with Jim Cornette. A grudge tag team match with Bill Dundee and Bobby Fulton against Coco Ware and Bobby Eaton. A Southern heavyweight title match where they did a stipulation where Lawler was going to defend the title against Jimmy Hart and a mystery partner. And if the, or the, the team of Jimmy Hart and his partner won the match, then Hart would become the Southern heavyweight champion, which they milked for a couple weeks, right? And it turned out to be Sabu the Wild Man, who was not Sabu, but that was before Sabu. It was Coco Samoa, who was kind of like, at that time, like a the closest thing in the business to a Jacob Fatu. 
and they put Sabu over big for a few months in the territory, and so they won. So Hart became the Southern champion. And then the fabulous ones uh, wrestled the New York Dolls for the Southern Tag Title versus World Tag Title. And I know a lot of titles here, but there really wasn't a goddamn uh, plethora of them because the New York Dolls had won the WWA World Tag Title that uh, Jared had started recognizing when he started working with Bruiser. And the fabulous ones were the real Southern Tag Team champions, and the World Tag Team title faded away after the New York Dolls Fabs thing got introduced. Hey, what so was... So point... Go ahead. What was Rick McGraw like in the back? Um, He was a nice guy. Fun, you know, nice, laughing, friendly. You know, a, a good worker. A strong guy, even though he was short. It was a shame that, you know... He was one of the first guys that uh, in the modern era that started having heart attacks. But anyway, the point I was going to make is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20 guys, including the managers, on the card, right? And that card drew 8,056 people. Now we go ahead one year to November 14, 1983. Lawler is booking. And there's, uh, there's a lot of talent turnover. Some guys are still there that were there the previous year. But listen to this card. The opening match. Eight-man tag team match. Grappler, Buddy Landell, Carl Fergie, and the Russian Invader, who was bounty hunter Jerry Novak, against Tom Pritchard, the Jaguar, who was Danny Davis, Dutch Mantell and Robert Reed. Robert Reed was one of Lawler's friends that played softball and did jobs on the TV show. How many of those guys lasted in the 84? Well, hold on. The Moondogs versus U.S. Steel and Plowboy Frazier. U.S. Steel was a guy named, I think his name was Rick Steel, and he was like 350 pounds, and they had broken him in and trained him over the previous six months or whatever, and then Plowboy was. So that was an 800-pound tag team against the Moondogs. Coco Ware and Bobby Eaton against the A-team, who were Roger Smith and Donnie Bass, the ex-assassins, with Jimmy Hart. Bill Dundee versus Tommy Rogers for the U.S. Junior Heavyweight title. The Southern title versus the international title. <laughs> I hate to say this, but Lawler may have had a bit of Tony Khan in him. Austin Idol versus Jesse Ventura. Not guys who like to work cheap. The Southern Tag Team title, the Bruise Brothers, Pork Chop Cash and the Dream Machine against the Rock and Roll Express, the World Tag Team title that they had reinstituted, the Fabulous Ones versus Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin, and a handicap boxing and wrestling match with Jerry Lawler versus Jimmy Hart and Andy Kaufman. And eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, including Lawler and Kaufman, 31 guys on the card, and it drew 3,800 people. Wow. That's the difference. Lawler it, it did great during the summer, but he had too many guys that focused. It was, it was a mess at that point. There were too many people to focus on. It was all over the place, and and the the Kaufman novelty was wearing off, and it, it just it wasn't working. You said it jokingly, but when you really think about it, there are some similarities in Lawler's booking and what Tony Khan tends to try to do. A and lot that's, of guys and that's the problem is that and I'm you know everybody knows Love Lawler is a talent and and one of my all-time favorite wrestlers and one of the best ever. But he wasn't the best booker except for his own shit. He innately naturally knew how to get over and what his opponent should do against him and Nick Bockwinkle said he was the best match caller he'd ever been in the ring with blah blah blah. But he didn't want to put the work in, and he didn't want to tell anybody no, and he didn't keep fiscal, you know, attention on the goddamn cards. He would just, you know, so that's the thing. So 
they had 13 more guys and drew half the crowd. That's why Jerry Jarrett was stepping back in. And pretty soon they'd, they'd be done with goddamn 15 or 20 of these people. And the main events would be Jerry Lawler and Randy Savage. And they'd be drawn twice the crowd again with literally a little over half the people on the card. Here's another opening match on December 19th. The Moondogs, Angelo Poffo and Franklin Hayes versus Bobby Eaton, Ricky Morton, the Jaguar, and Art Cruz. Followed by a mixed man and midget match, a tag match. <laughs> Dutch Mantel versus Dennis Condry in a loser leave town match. I wonder who won that. The Fabs at Roughhouse Fargo against the A-Team and the Rushed Invader. Les Thornton against Stagger Lee for the World Junior Heavyweight title. And Lawler and Idol against Savage and LeDuc. What do you think of Dennis losing the loser leaves town to Dutch, even though Dennis was leaving? Is that hot shot booking? I mean, was there a feud between Dutch and Dennis Condry that would have needed a blow-off match? Could Dennis have well, just yeah. left without anyone noticing? Well, no. Yes, there was because, you see, on December 5th, <laughs> it had been Dutch and Austin Idol against Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin, and they did a tag match, and then the following week, they were in a 12-man $5,000 challenge match, and then the following... Oh, I'm sorry, and then a grudge match single match also. And then they oh, did okay. the loser leave town. You know, it was a three week program, but, but point being, you know, they, they had to get a lot of these people out of there. And that was a difference in, in how different bookers approached the same thing, but sometimes with different success. But again, I look to January by the time that Lawler and Savage got going, here's a, a card that drew 78, 29. And here's one 77, 34. And they still didn't have as as big a a late winter, early spring as you would expect with Savage around because there were some that were bad weather and some that were just down, but they were still doing, you know, five, six, seven thousand people a week. And with here's a, a card from I'm gonna get back to the topic uh again here in a second. What, November? Yeah, November, but <laughs> here here's a card from April. That drew, I'm trying to, because the way this is laid out, I'm trying to make sure I'm getting the right results. On April 2nd, here was the card that drew 7,500 people. Scott Shannon against Jesse Ortega. Oh, my God. And uh, Scott Shannon was not the... The DJ? I, I, I don't think, although he came from Memphis and he knew Lawler. He knew Lawler, you know. yeah. Goddamn, maybe it was. But he was already on Z100, I think, maybe by that point. Well, so hopefully. Know. But Oxbaker ver Oxbaker. Oxbaker versus Art Cruz, Dutch Mantel versus Randy Savage, Austin Idol versus Rick Rude, The Fabs versus Norvell Austin and Coco Ware, Handsome Jimmy Valiant versus the Assassin Number One with Paul Jones handcuffed to Jerry Lawler. And then Joe LaDuke and Jimmy Hart against Jerry Lawler and JJ Dillon. Every match past the first two preliminaries meant something. And there were only six, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18 guys on the card, 19 if you count the managers. Crockett wasn't really on national TV. What do you think about bringing Paul Jones? The, what the they did was the, the angle between Valiant and Jones and the assassin, they sent tape because Jimmy Valiant was such a drawing card in Memphis that they sent tape of an angle that they had done and brought the match to Memphis and called it the Boogie Jam 84, just like they were doing in in the Carolinas for Crockett. And uh, that's what brought the house up to 7,500 people was Jimmy Valiant being on the card. The previous week, I think it was 5,700 and then 5,000. So Jimmy in those days was good for about 2,500 people. Was he always cool with them with money? Uh, you know, certain wrestlers may be like, okay, I see I draw a bigger house than your normal crew. I want more money. Was he always cool with them or was ever an issue? No, he, I think when he got to the point where he knew what he was drawing and they knew what he was worth, that they were, they were cool. He never held them up in terms of the house is bigger tonight because he got paid on the houses. He's, I, and they would give you, in those days, like Idol and those guys would get a minimum guarantee, but if the house was a sellout and they only got the minimum, there'd be a stink. They knew that. So I think Jimmy was probably taking care. Well, they bought him a house that one time. 
Well, that doesn't so, count. Well, but I mean, they were taking care of him as best they could, realistically. And I don't. I think every once in a while he might, oh, you know, King, geez, look at the house or whatever. But I don't recall any any falling outs like uh, Idol had or anything where you know Jimmy didn't show up for any other reasons than health or missed planes, which still caused chaos. Anyway, you want to go back to November now and start from scratch. November 1983, 40 years ago, as we speak. On the 1st of November, I started the month in Wilson, Arkansas, on a $1,700 house making $50. I believe I mentioned this on the last one we did when we overlapped here. I lost to Tom Pritchard by disqualification in a match and then managed the Bruise Brothers against Bobby Eaton and Dutch Mantell. And for whatever reason, Austin Idol was on this card that didn't draw. And that may have been probably because it was next to Memphis and he was going to fly out the next day. And he beat Buddy Landell. And that was a day. I had been in Memphis the previous day and stayed over and went to Wilson, then 260 miles back to Nashville. And I was off for the next two days because they were starting to cut down on these secondary shows, and there was so many guys. Do you say anything to anyone, even if it's not the office, just any of the wrestlers you talk to, just, are you concerned? Oh, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm asking, like, if I'm riding with Bobby Eaton to the towns, or if I'm, you know, in the locker room with any of the guys that, you know, in those shows, there's only five or six other guys in the locker room, so, and you're bored to tears, so I'm like, Jesus Christ, can this get any worse? We were all miserable. November 4th was Munfordville, Kentucky. And I got $50. And look who was there with me on what couldn't have been more than a $2,000 house. Buddy Landell beat Ricky Morton. Dutch Mantell beat me and Jimmy Hart. And Ricky and Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton beat Dennis Condry, Norvell Austin, and Buddy Landell. So, you know, it's it, like those guys, I'm still at least lucky to be there and wondering how much longer I'm going to be there. But these guys have been in the business for years and trying to do it seriously. Right. And they're like fucking Munfordville. So it was, it was not a, a good time for everybody in the territory at that point. And then the, the fifth was a Saturday, November 5th. And we were in Nashville because that's when, you know, after I, as a matter of fact, you I'm not even I've not written down. I didn't go to TV. I wasn't on TV. So at least I only had to make a 30 mile round trip that Saturday. Cause I made 80 bucks, but the other guys had had to go to TV and come back. But would you see that as a bad sign? The fact that you're yes. going to go to TV. <laughs> yes. Yes. It, it would new, and I would talk to Frank Morell too, daddy Frank. Right. Cause he'd been through the Georgia thing with me too. And he'd been in business for 20 years at that point. And, you know, he's like, kid, you can only do what you can do. You know, nobody was saying that I was sucking or that it, you know, that I was the shits or I wasn't doing a good job. And there were a lot of other people on this buttermilk run in the same position. It's just there wasn't any room. So, and in Nashville, by the way, Frank Morell, the angel, beat Bobby Fulton. Dutch beat Norvell Austin by disqualification. Condry Austin and Landell beat the Gibsons and Morton. And then I managed the assassins against the fabulous ones. I'm managing the heels in every single one of these fucking matches. So uh, that week I made $255 for working fucking four times, but I, for four days, but I actually worked what almost 20 times. And that's the the only good thing was I was getting the experience, but that was fixing to fucking go. In Memphis on November 7th, I was actually there. The house was $16,000, which was not good. And my payoff was 85 bucks. And, but listen to some of these matches. They, Lawler was booking these guys. If you took any one of these matches off the card, it wouldn't have affected the house. U.S. Steel over Carl Fergie, the Russian Invader over Bobby Fulton, Dennis Condry and Norvell Austin beat Bobby Eaton and the Jaguar, and Buddy Landell beat Tom Pritchard. I worked all of those. That wasn't the whole card. 
That wasn't even the fucking main. As a matter of fact, November 7th. Hold on here one second. What was the main event on November 7th that only drew 16 grand? That is what I would like to know. November 7th. Okay. Those that I just mentioned were the first four matches on the card. We also got Bruce Brothers versus Rock and Roll Express, Tommy Rogers versus Bill Dundee, Jesse Ventura versus Coco Ware, Lawler, Idol, and Mantell versus the Moondogs and Man Mountain Link, and the main event, Hair versus Mask, Assassins versus Fabulous Ones. Huh. So, again, we'd, we'd lost it. And there was too many guys. So, then on November 8th, Election Day, by the way. When was the, if I could just jump in real quick, when was yes. the first time you heard any whispers that the Fabulous Ones were unhappy? Because they would go to the AWA pretty quickly in 84. Well, I don't know that they were unhappy at that point. I'm trying, no, as a matter of fact, yes, when they came back was when they got a guarantee. They finally, they were unhappy and Vern dangled you know, that big, the AWA TV was still big at that point, and they didn't know that he wasn't going to understand anything about how to present them, and the run was not going to be anything to speak of, and it was a chance to make a lot more money, even if Memphis was selling out. But then to come back, they got $1,500 a week guarantees each from Jarrett, plus, regardless of how many days they worked, few or not, plus uh, they got all their gimmick money, and that was another couple grand a week apiece sometimes, so they were doing quite well. And then, as I mentioned, came November the 8th in Harrisburg, Arkansas. Listen to this. Jerry Lawler and Jesse Ventura was the main event, and it did $3,890, which in those days was what? Four grand at a five dollar? was 800 fucking people. Lawler against Ventura. I managed Jesse Ventura. Rock and Roll Express against Condry and Carl Fergie. Norvell didn't make it. Uh, but that's, you know, did Ventura was not work, good. Did Ventura work for the territory? <sighs> Obviously, he has the promo. He's considered a great promo, but... Not really, because the matches were not good. Because... <sighs> The promos were good, but uh, Tennessee had seen every great promo in the world. And at the same time, you had Austin Idol and Jerry Lawler and Stan Hansen. At the same time as you have Jesse Ventura, v Ventura's promos didn't really stand out. And he was not a great worker, and he didn't have the history here where people had seen him like he had the build in the AWA from when he was years younger. He wasn't necessarily motivated to get hurt coming down and work in Memphis part time. So no, it, it it nobody. If you ask the Tennessee wrestling fans, Jesse Ventura would not be in the top thirty or forty names they would mention of Lawler's great rivals. But I hate to say that about the governor. Well, you know, not everyone works in every territory they go to. Yeah, and it, it it didn't work. He he, he the, the people expected a level of bumps, action, aggression, uh, things that Jesse didn't have in the, in the ring, or at least did show at that point. Uh, November 9th, I was off, because there was nothing running apparently against Evansville. Princeton, Indiana, on Thursday, November 10th. So apparently I wasn't... <laughs> I wasn't in fucking Evansville, but I was in the spot show 15 miles from it the next goddamn day. And I'll, I'll save it. I, I was out, uh, eliminated in a battle royal and managed another five matches for $65. We went to Owensboro on November 11th and same thing for another $80. And then from Owensboro, I had to drive to fucking Memphis 300 miles to do TV for free the next morning and then head 150 miles back to Parsons, Tennessee for the spot show that night where I made another $65. But listen to who was the main event in Parsons. Lawler and Dutch Mantell beat the Moondogs. And it still didn't draw $2,500. And, you know, they, the towns had been played out, the spot shows, and things weren't interesting. So, so then, 
Go ahead. So at the same time where Mid-South Wrestling is having issues where things have slowed down, business has slowed down, the same thing is happening right next door in this territory. For the exact opposite reason. Watts was short on talent. Jared had too much talent. It was it was all lost. There was no focus, and and there were too many titles on the line and too many short, quick matches. And, you know, because the... the the Memphis shows, when there were 40 guys on the card, they still lasted two and a half hours. They started at 7.30. They were over at 10 o'clock, whether you had five matches or 15. And so people were kind of noticing it, just the, the, they didn't have the feel of it. And then we come to the time we talked about uh, several shows ago, November 14th in Memphis. That's when Watts came to look at the talent. And that's when Jarrett auditioned me more or less to get rid of me. I managed Condry and Austin to beat the fabulous ones for the world tag team title. Uh, and then when the Bruce brothers were wrestling the rock and roll express, the fabs came out to get even with me and gave me the spike pile driver on the concrete floor. And I, I'd also managed the moon dogs against plowboy Frazier and us steel earlier in the night. So I went from doing nothing in Memphis and sometimes not being on the card to when I walked in, they immediately brought me in the finish room and I'm like, what the fuck? I'm, I'm actually doing something. And that's where Jerry Jarrett was giving the finishes personally that night. And he talked, well, we're going to go back to the old times. We're going to get a long set of heat with the baby face fighting for the tag. We're going to do this and do that. And he was laying it out in more detail than what, Lawler had done, and, and a lot of times what Dundee had done. But in his more, Dundee was more excitable. I'd blow up watching him act out a finish. Jarrett was very methodical and very professorial about it. Did it relieve any of the talent, the fact that, okay, they realized we got to do something different? A, a number of guys were looking back and forth at Jarrett and, at, you know, just at each other like, okay... You know, it appears like he, because he had not been involved real personally over the, right since I'd been gone before the summertime. But, you know, and, and by the way, the house that night in Memphis was $12,300, which was abysmal, less than 3,000 people. And as a matter of fact, you'll, you'll remember that I said that that, that past January, <laughs> Coming off a sellout with Lawler and Bockwinkle the previous week, Christmas week, and then they came back on a Sunday afternoon with me, Adrian Street, and Linda against Bill Dundee and Jerry Calhoun and no Jerry Lawler on the card. And it was the biggest drop in the history of Memphis. It went from 39000 to 11500 this was $800 more than that abysmal house with every goddamn body we had on the card. How come Watts, if he went there scouting talent and he saw what he saw in you, and obviously he saw what he saw in Bobby and Dennis, but not Norvell. I mean, Norvell would come over later in 84 with the PYTs with Coco, but if he's watching the earlier version of the Midnight Express, Norvell and Dennis, how come... That wasn't the team Watts wanted. They weren't being called the Midnight Express then. They had been previously, but they at, when it was all three of them with Randy Rose in Memphis, but they weren't using Midnight Express at that point. That's why Watts asked Dennis, well, what kind of name can we call the team? And Dennis said, how about Midnight Express? I don't know otherwise than... I like Norvell, but I th Norvell at that point had got real comfortable in Memphis and maybe he didn't work as hard as Watts thought or bump as hard. Or, I mean, being partners with Dennis Condry, at that point, Dennis was one of the the best workers in the business, heel or babyface. You, you can't get around it. In, just in terms of his in-ring work, being in the right place, bumping, feeding, being a heel, knowing how to call shit, and all of his shit looked good. He never had a place, never made a mistake. He wasn't going to be the WWF champion or the NWA champion, but he was so good at that. You know, so it was hard being compared to, you know, that guy's your partner, Norvell. was Norvell at that point. And then Bobby Eaton's out there, who I'm sure Watts had never seen, probably never heard of, and he's just being Bobby. 
and you know blew everybody away so you know and Dennis was a he old Bobby was a baby face at that point and I was just floating around so what saw people the way he wanted to use them rather than the way they were presented to him I guess that's what any good promoter should do yes any good booker. especially Booker so yeah, so I made eighty bucks that night and got a goddamn got the biggest job of my life. So you actually met Watts that night? No. So you didn't no. meet Watts until you went to the. I was court. I was out there working my ass off trying to impress Jerry Jarrett. I didn't really. I think, in hindsight, I think somebody said, "Hey, that's Bill Watts back there on the babyface side," because there were separate sides of babyface and the heels in Memphis, and you know I wasn't gonna. You didn't go if you were the goddamn ice cream vendor in those days and fucking shake hands with the goddamn president of the company. I wasn't going to go and interrupt Bill Watts in any conversation to introduce myself when he wouldn't give a fuck whether I was alive or dead until he was interested in me. But anyway. When, when, you, when I first heard this story from you years ago, I had this like vision of Watts sitting like in a second row amongst the fans, like looking at them and watching their reaction. No, no. I know, I know. I wish, I no. wish that was what it was. But there, there was plenty of room for him to come out in the building that night. He didn't come all the way to ringside, but he didn't get accosted by a lot of the fans back in the cheap seats. And that's when uh, Tuesday and Wednesday was the normal days for Louisville and Evansville, and there was no secondary town running, so I was off both those days. I just went back to Nashville. And that's why we were in Liberty, Kentucky, on November 17th, and that's when Dennis came up to me and said, I need to talk to you. And you know, Dennis had that face. I'm always, oh, you need to talk. What did I do? And he calls me out of the locker room. We were at this little dingy, I think it might even have been a middle school gym. And I remember these locker rooms were dark and small. And he called me where the boys, the other boys weren't because, you know, I don't think anybody knew about this. I didn't know. So I guess the other guys didn't. And he said to me, he said, Bill Watts wants to bring me and Bobby in, in as a team and you to manage us into his territory. And I kind of chuckled because I'm, and I'm, I'm looking for him to laugh. And Dennis didn't laugh that much, you know, and things like that. But I'm waiting for him to laugh. And I'm thinking, why is Dennis ribbing me like this? Right? I can barely get booked in goddamn Liberty. And he's, I said, no. Nah. And he said, no, I'm serious. <laughs> Watt's going to bring me and Bobby in as a team and you as our manager. And he says, we're going to make between 50 and a hundred thousand dollars a piece next year. And I mean, while I'm in Liberty, Kentucky, the house was $1,300. Even at the ticket prices in those days, $5 average. What's that? Goddamn 250 people. I'm going to make $50. And I've been doing absolutely fuck all of nothing except going out on spot shows and killing myself working. And I'm thinking, what, how can this be? And he assured me that he was serious. And he said, I, I can't remember if I, if he said, call the office tomorrow or they're going to call you. We're going to get plane tickets. We're going next week to do television. I'm like, what the fuck? Plane tickets? These motherfuckers, I've been working for these fuckers for a year. They haven't even offered to buy me a tank of gas to go to Water Valley, Mississippi. I'm getting a fucking plane ticket. So, so yeah, that was kind of uh, bizarre. And then uh, the rest of that week, we were in Glasgow, Kentucky. The next night, $1,900. I I made 50 bucks four more matches, then Bowling Green. I made $50 on Saturday night. I was off on Sunday. And then they booked me in Memphis on November 21st. And when I got there, I was wearing a neck brace that they didn't tell me to, to wear. But as soon as, you know, we had one, I think I already had one from an angle we'd done previously, but I got spike pile driven so the people up north didn't know about it that week, but the next week I come into Memphis, I'm wearing a neck brace, and that's when they realize, well, shit, no sense in you going out, you're hurt, right? I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> and I hadn't made TV that weekend, so people may have thought I was dead, right? 
And that house was only like 11 or 12 grand. They gave me a $70 payoff for just coming down and sitting there. But, and then Brian, November 22nd and November 23rd, look at the difference here. On November 22nd, I was in Katy's, Kentucky. The house was $963. That wasn't even 200 people. I made $50. I managed Buddy Landell over Bobby Eaton, the grappler Lynn Denton over the Jaguar, who I mentioned was Danny Davis, and I managed the Bruise Brothers, and they got beat by the Rock and Roll Express and went back to fucking Nashville, and the next day we went to the airport and flew to Shreveport, Louisiana, and I became the lead heel manager of Mid-South Wrestling. <laughs> and... I got paid. We he paid us, even though you in those days, I've mentioned this before. The goddamn regular stars and the talent in a territory didn't get paid for television or only got a nominal fee, right? Like Crockett gave you forty dollars. You didn't get paid for Memphis TV at all because you were the stars. That's what got you over. They'd pay the job guys. Well, Watts paid all three of us to a hundred dollars a piece for making the TV plus bought our plane tickets. So all we were out was $25 at the Alamo Plaza and 15 bucks for a nice dinner. And I, that was the biggest payoff I'd had in fucking three months. And yeah, they sent the plane tickets, which came and, you know, we left Nashville and at Shreveport at the airport. And I'm thinking, what the fuck is this plane is taken off. I'm like, my God, they're flying me somewhere to do this on purpose. And we get to Shreveport. He sent Grizzly Smith to pick us up. And we had no earthly idea about anything about Grizzly Smith at that point. Otherwise than I being a wrestling historian knew he was one of the Kentuckians and Dennis being the smartest one of us to the wrestling business knew that he was Bill Watts's number one stooge and we better watch what we say and what we do and be exemplary employees. And he carted us over to the Alamo Plaza, which was the shittiest hotel that I've regularly stayed at in my entire life. And you had to get the, we found out you had to get the building on the left rather than the one on the right. If you didn't want the bugs. And they, they, the guys got a $25 a night rate. However many people you want to put in the room, whatever. And then he took us to the, the fairgrounds there, the Irish McNeil Boys Club. And we saw how this TV was done. And everybody's seen the Mid-South footage from the Irish McNeil. But they had a great crowd in those bleachers, so it looked good. It was a basketball rec center type gym so they didn't use all of it but what they did use they shot well with what it was a two camera plus something on the announcers cheap to produce the people came every two weeks and that tv show even though memphis tv the ratings were so strong then it went to louisville it went to nashville to evansville to lexington and, you know, we had the auxiliary small TVs in Tupelo, Mississippi, and Jackson, Tennessee. This fucking TV was playing in New Orleans, in Houston, in Oklahoma City, in Tulsa, in Jackson, Mississippi, Little Rock, Arkansas, every major market and minor in the state of Louisiana, Biloxi, Mississippi. I was seen then by more people than had ever seen me before in my brief time in the wrestling business just by being on that TV one week. Who was the first person you heard from that saw you on TV that couldn't believe it? Someone who knew you from the WFIA? Now, outside of Memphis, obviously, in Mid-South. Oh, gosh. Um, well, no, anybody I knew from the WFIA, they, would have, they wouldn't have been, like, gobsmacked because they knew I was in the business. And I'm trying to think. Hildebrand was out of his mind. I remember that. He was like, oh, that's great. Um, Brian Hildebrand, I should say, or referee Mark Curtis to the uninitiated. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I had never even really, when I think about it, besides I, I instantly kind of knew Bruce Pritchard because I'd been working with Tom. 
And so when we started going to Houston, you know, that's where my long relationship with Brother Brucey began. But I'd never even really had a lot of pen pals or contacts in that territory. Randy Hales is the one who had gotten me most of the Mid-South TV tapes um, on VHS or Beta because he lived in Jonesboro. He was close enough where he could get the Little Rock TV. Um, but anyway, never. Oh, and by the way, our two first matches, the very first match we had as a team, we beat Mike Jackson, who is still wrestling today at 75. It's the same one. And his partner was Rick Rude, the same one. With his original great. spelling. R-O-O-D, greener than a pepper tree, as Frank Spaceman Hickey would say. And then we did, because there were two tapes done that night, the second match, we beat uh, Josh Stroud, who was this really good-looking bodybuilder kid that, you know, worked for a couple years, never really made it, and Lanny Poffo was his partner, because Lanny was fixed to finish up and head to Memphis. What was that like for you, working with Lanny after all the heat for so many years? Not that you were in the middle of it, well, but you knew of it. Well, yeah, it it was bizarre in that, you know, I was only a photographer when it was the ICW and Jarrett war. So, but still just to be on the opposite side of a, of a member of ICW after all that was strange, but it, it, thank, thankfully he was there because Josh was green at that point and it wouldn't have been pretty if we hadn't had Lanny. Who told you guys no top roper? Did you know? Uh, it, no, it was, it was, I'm sure it was reinforced to us, but see, there was no top rope in Memphis either. Hmm. See, remember, that's the thing is a lot of people haven't noticed when Bobby was starting to do the finishes off the ropes in Mid-South, he was coming off the second rope because off the top rope was an automatic disqualification as it had been in Tennessee since the dawn of time. So we had no problem adapting because that had been the conditions we were working under. And where Bobby got to open up off the top rope, really, you could do it in Dallas, in world class. It was not illegal, but he didn't very much because the rings were harder than Chinese arithmetic, and he'd have killed himself. But then Crockett, by that point, had no top rope rule, and when we got on TBS, it's Bobby have at it. Anyway, so the next day was Thanksgiving, and we went back to Nashville and ate Thanksgiving dinner at Bill Dundee's house. And boy, howdy, Jamie was only like eight years old then. So he was a fun kid to be around. And then, okay, now, again, I've just been to Mid-South Wrestling where they have announced to the goddamn locker room, the Midnight Express are coming in. They're the new top heel team. And here's Jim Cornette. He's their manager. And we're going to push these motherfuckers to the moon. On the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend, I was in Springfield, Tennessee in front of it looks like by the house, 150 people, uh, me and Jimmy Hart getting beaten up by Bobby Eaton. And then after Springfield, which is Tracy Smothers' hometown, right up northeast of Nashville, I had to go 225 miles down to Memphis to do TV the next morning because I came out, I remember this, I came out with the neck brace and my arm in a sling. It just went, behind jimmy doing the promo because i was still hurt and that was what i did for it was a 450 mile round trip to stand there in a neck brace and go Arr! and then go to jonesboro that night and even hurt coco Ware beat me and jimmy hart in a handicap match i got 75 bucks and went 285 miles back to nashville so from the time i left springfield tennessee at 10 o'clock on friday night i drove 570 miles and did a free TV taping and got beat up in a handicap match. When were you told that Dundee was going to be the booker? That you and I have tried to pinpoint that and narrow it down in the past because of some retrospectives we had done on Mid-South and other things. Did you know when you went to Thanksgiving dinner? You know, I think, I think so. But even though I don't remember him being at the first taping that we were at, I don't remember him being there until the second taping we went to. So, I'm, you know, it might just, well, also remember Bobby was 
married to Donna at that point. So, you know, and they knew I was sitting there in fucking Nashville twiddling my thumbs. So it could have just been a charitable, a charitable in invitation, but he also could have been wanting to make sure he got on all the fucking boys on his good side before he took the book. Was it this year or the previous year where he told Bobby that he had to come over to the house and jerk off the dog or whatever the story was? No, that that was no, that was when Dundee took his first trip down, which probably was in front of the the next taping that we went. Dundee went down, and spent three or four days with Watts in Oklahoma, and to talk about the the plans. And that was when Dundee had this. I don't know if it was a pit bull or a Rottweiler or what is big old badass looking dog. And he told Bobby he needed Bobby to come over and take care of it. Bobby said, okay, he thought, like, feed, water, whatever. And then Dundee, because he knows that Bobby is scared of big dogs anyway. He's got a weak stomach. He's scared of big dogs. He had all the phobias, right? And so Dundee compounds it by fucking telling him, now, you know, mate, if you don't take care of him every couple of days, he's going to get mean. He'll bite your ass. What do you mean take care? Well, you've got to jack him off. Keep him happy. What? He had Bobby convinced he was going to have to go over and jack that fucking dog off every two days or every time he tried to feed the dog, the dog would eat his ass. Fortunately, it didn't come to where he actually, he didn't milk it all the way. I think he, Bobby just finally said no, and he, well, he started laughing anyway. But there you go, and I was off the rest of the fucking month of November. I was off the 27th. I was off the 28th. I was off the 29th. I was off the 30th. And by the way, December 1st, I was in Lexington, Kentucky. For whatever reason, out of was Jimmy Hart sick. I was there with Condry and Austin when they lost to the fabulous ones. And then I was off for another fucking four days in a row. And then we'll talk about this as we get into more of the Mid-South run. But I made a few more... Tennessee appearances, basically when, when I was in Nashville and Jimmy didn't want to be, or cause I was in Louisville and Jimmy didn't want to be. And, you know, otherwise than that, they were glad to be rid of me and couldn't wait for the time where I would be in Tennessee or in Louisiana full time. Although, although I've got to say this, the two week program that I am most proud of, of my rookie year December 10th and December 17th, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And since I was the one to manage all the heels, I managed the fabulous or managed the Bruce brothers in a cage match against the fabulous ones in the main event on the 10th. And then came back. And on the 17th, I was at a six man cage match, me and the Bruce brothers against the fabulous ones and rough house Fargo. I wrestled rough house Fargo. <laughs> And that was, the, and I was scared shitless because they try, started ribbing me that Rough House was going to blade me whether I liked it or not. And then as soon as I got in the ring with him, he grabbed me in a headlock and took his thumbnail and started running across my head saying, watch the blade, kid. I'm like, oh shit, I got to make TV in Mid-South. <laughs> and, but then he headbutted me and goddamn, I'd rather he'd have cut me. It was, it was the stiffest old prick. God damn, he'd kill you. He touched you, it hurt. What did you but, say to your mom and when? Um, as soon as I was certain that Dennis wasn't ribbing me, I don't know whether I told her until I got the, either called the office or got the phone call from the office, but then I told her, I said, guess what? And she didn't know who Bill Watts was, but I said, the promoter in Louisiana wants to bring us down and give us the top spot. And, I'm going to be moving to Louisiana. And obviously she was like, oh boy, because she knew the, you know, the level of business that I was involved in at that point and that I was not setting the world on fire. And, and so she was trepidatious, but as I convinced her that it was a significant step up, and then she, well, just be careful. And thank God she wasn't going to the matches at that point where she talked to any of the boys about the Louisiana territory and they all universally said, my God, they'll kill Cornette in three weeks. Cause that probably would have not made her very happy. But, um, did you have any kind of like final conversation? I mean, it sounds so silly saying it like that, but thank you, Jerry Jarrett, you know, hopefully I'll see you again down the road or did you have any goodbyes with any of the people that you'd seen since the beginning of your 
wrestling career than well, you knew with, you were leaving. With with Jared Jarrett, no, because actually you never saw him. I never saw he never booked me back in Memphis. <laughs> and and he wasn't coming to he went to Memphis and he went to TV. And sometimes he wasn't going to TV. And so, you know, but I mean, he I'm sure he figured, well, Cornette's happy, and I'm rid of him, and along with these other guys that I couldn't fucking pay. But we, I, I said goodbye to all the people that I was in the locker room with, you know, sparingly over the last few weeks that I was there. But again, it, back in those days, the wrestling business, you didn't have glorious goodbyes unless you were really close personal friends and it was all planned because sometimes guys just left and you didn't see them before they, they went. Um, but it's a little but different we, with you just because, again, yeah. you're a little more sentimental. You started as a fan. You've been with this company. Yes, this well, and, and I definite, definitely did say goodbye to Teeny because the last time I was in Louisville was what uh, was – I was in Louisville on December the 6th, and I knew and I figured I probably wasn't going to be back again. So, you know, and, and she was excited about it because – you know, she knew what it was like for guys to start in the wrestling business and then go to a bigger territory and get a better spot or whatever. And I, you know, I'm sure she was, you know, sad to see me go, but it was better than me. she wasn't seeing me and I was working there. I was in fucking Batesville, right? She wasn't seeing me to begin with. And 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 one more thing I will say that we wanted to call Jerry Jarrett because we really did. Dennis, Bobby, myself, Ricky, Robert, Dundee. Remember, Dundee had come back from Georgia, and he couldn't even. He'd lost a loser leave town. He couldn't even get back in the big towns right away. He'd been on this buttermilk run. Long about March or April, in mid South, we started doing the joke. Hey, Bill, can you call Jerry Jarrett and tell him to send down some bigger buildings? Because his rejects are selling these son of a bitches out, as Ricky would say, and they're bigger than the ones he's got. That is something, isn't it? So anyway, and yeah, and, and basically in the month of December, we made another TV taping. We uh, went to Shreveport again on December the 7th and did three TVs, which were to propel us through the holiday time. And we beat Mike Jackson and Coco Ware, uh, Mike Jackson and somebody who, who I didn't record the name and Randy Barber and somebody who I didn't record the name because they were the local guys and I was verklempt and couldn't remember it. But that that carried us through till Christmas Day. We started full time in New Orleans and we'll cover that sometime in December. I have you guys against George Weingroff and John King and Doug. Uh, no, that's not your match. And then also George Weingroff and Randy Barber. Okay, it was Weingaroff and Randy Barber. Well, then why did I say, oh, okay, I got Jackson twice. Sorry about that. And I remember John King. I remember him because that was actually the name of my grandfather on my mother's side. And suddenly we're beating him up. Some interesting guys in the locker room when you first arrive in Mid-South. Tom Lintz, who had a short little thing on TV that went nowhere, but he was there. Magnum TA. Well, you weren't really in the babyface locker room, so you wouldn't have seen Magnum TA. Well, we, we in Shreveport, everybody was together. And there are a few of the towns, everybody was together. So I did meet all these people for the first time. And Tom Tom Lynch was Boomer Lynch at one point. He was a, just a gregarious fella, but didn't didn't go very far. And Magnum was a nice guy, but boy, he was. He was green. That being our first program, him and wrestling too. It was like the most experienced guy in the in the territory and the greenest. It, well, and, no, not the greenest. What'd you think of early Dr. Death when you first met him? Oh, boy, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Doc, and again, you know, Doc was a great guy to hang out in a locker room with, but Bobby and Dennis and I were all looking around. Here is Nikolai Volkov, six foot three, 320, ex-boxer, fucking Crusher Darso, goddamn 300 pounds. He's a fucking bouncer friend of the road warriors there's goddamn ernie lad is 6'9 325 when he cracks his knuckles it sounds like breaking a broomstick here's uh, dr death steve williams four-time all-american football and wrestling 285 pounds stiff as a goddamn board and brand new hacksaw duggan played pro football we're looking at ourselves and go what the fuck are we gonna do in this territory and that was bump. the key bump 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Take bumps and and get heat and move. And that's what it needed. The rock and roll in the midnight. And then Terry Taylor and Magnum kept coming along. They started people moving in the ring. And they started drawing the women. And they started the, the music matches. Videos. Were, the music videos. MTV updated the fucking style a little bit. And it was still Watts's vision of wrestling. It was, it was all legitimate, logical. It was treated as a sport. Nothing was allowed to get out of out of hand to be completely unrealistic, except for junkyard dad, junkyard dog in the locker room. There's another guy. He was jacked at that point. And but it was with younger, better looking, faster, more exciting, different personalities than what they'd seen. I was completely the opposite of Skandor Akbar, who had been the hottest manager in the territory up until that point. You couldn't get any more different than me and Ak, just because we were completely different people and different gimmicks. But it, it registered with everybody, and the booking was taken up a step because, you know, let's face it, Watts had an intricate mind, and he was a fantastic booker, but the guys that he hired whether it be the Buck Robleys or the Ernie Lads, had learned in completely different places, in a completely different generation, whereas Dundee was younger and had all those Tennessee ideas that they had been done so long and so often in Tennessee that they were just done by the numbers and they weren't explained and they weren't, the most wasn't made out of it. The the blindfold battle royal where 18 guys are blindfolded and thrown in the ring and the last man gets fucking $10,000. That was a spot show match in Tennessee because it'd been done to death and people had seen it over the years. Watts said, wait a minute, what is this? <laughs> I can make this sound like it more dangerous than goddamn nuclear fallout. And for a two week period, he main evented the towns with that match saying, imagine what it's going to be like when 20 guys that are blind and weigh 250 pounds apiece have to throw each other over the top rope to win this money. And it drew. That was the, it was just, it was a change in talent and presentation it, with, without a change in philosophy or the rules of the game. And he went from a bad year to the biggest year he ever had in business. And you went from a bad yeah. year to the biggest yeah. year you've ever had in a business as well yes. in 1984. And well, and that's, I mean, that's like being the nicest guy in prison of the biggest year I'd had of all two and a half of them. But because of that, that's, you know, when, when the people heard about, well, there's this fucking guy named Junkyard Dog. If people in the wrestling business I'm talking about, in the business, promoters, talent. Guy named Junkyard Dog, who the fuck's he? I don't know, but he just drew 30,000 people in the Superdome. Maybe we better book his ass. Same thing happened. Who's Jim Cornette in the Midnight Express? I don't know, but they just drew 25,000 people in the Superdome. Maybe we ought to look at them. That made us, from the, we left there, we could go anywhere. <laughs> we wanted to go to the Carolinas. We got sidetracked to Dallas for six months. We told that story. Then we went to the Carolinas. And by that point, that was the biggest company that we could go to that wasn't the WWF. And anything else would have been a step backwards, so we never left. You said, we'll work anywhere. And they sent you to Dallas. And you said, we meant anywhere else. Anywhere else. Well, they, and see, that's the thing. They never told us till we already, they, they just said, you're finishing. Okay, well, we got a place that has already invited us. So we made that deal. And then, oh, but we want you to go to Dallas so we can keep bringing you back. Eh, these planes fly all, all over the country. But we didn't feel like exerting the authority that we may have had at that point because it, it would have been against the, the guys that were responsible for us being in demand, Bill Watson, Bill Dundee. So we went to Dallas. And we'll get there in a year or so, a little year and a half. <laughs> in a year and a half or so, I guess we'll get there. I Dallas. don't, you know, but if we're looking at doing my next 10 years month by month, we better speed up a little bit. I might not, not make it to the end of my final years. Oh, you got to make it to the herd review after all these years when we finally get to the herd years. All right. We have heard enough.